Um, let me welcome all of you to session 12, and I'll introduce you briefly to those who are just showing up to my co-host, Scott Teruli, good friend of mine and colleague. Um, he is an expert musician in a number of different ways, and uh, he both teaches uh, as, as a um, professor of guitar at Berklee School of Music, and he has a number of albums. He does a lot of studio work, a lot of gig work, and he, like me, is a metalhead since our childhood. So he and I have been chatting about metal stuff for years and years and years, and we thought that we would turn it into um, conversations that other people could share in as well. And one of the, the topics that he and I have been kicking around for a very long time is the nature of cover songs. And there's a lot to this topic as we're going to see. Um, it, it seems pretty straightforward and simple at first. What is a, a cover song? Well, it's just you take somebody else's music and you find some way to make it your own. Scott and I were joking around earlier today, Berkeley School of Music actually has a little uh, website about how to put your stuff onto. Um, uh, uh, what was it? YouTube, right? How to take your yep. stuff and um, make it into YouTubeable things. So that that's kind of funny to see. Uh, Scott was saying, "Well, they've caved into the digital." We'll we'll talk about that in in a bit. But there's there's actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a lot more to the nature of cover songs. We can ask about well. Why do they exist? Um, what are people getting out of covering other people's music? Has it changed over time? And actually, it has changed considerably over time. There's way, way more cover music out there now than there ever was in music history. And that includes the world of metal. So um, we actually came up with a list of our top 10 classic metal cover songs. And let me give a little definition of what we mean here by classic metal. This is not like the definitive definition, but what we're saying is stuff from the 70s and 80s. Sometimes people call this traditional heavy metal. Um, it's the era that we grew up with. Those are the, the bands that um, really played a, a major role. And Classic metal covers would include then all these bands that are doing covers of earlier music. So when Black Sabbath covers something um, by an earlier band or when Deep Purple does that in the beginning of their career, those would be examples of metal covers, right? When Judas Priest does one that we're going to talk about quite a bit, um, Diamonds and Rust by Joan Baez, that would be a metal cover as well. Um, I'm going to ask that people go off uh, camera when they come on because we're, we're trying to record this. So um, what else would be a metal cover? Well, when you have other metal bands covering other metal bands, and that could extend way out into the present time as well right? Um, because we, we have a, a vast world of heavy metal that looks back to predecessors. And, um, you know, we have constant covers being done. We also have different kinds of albums as well. Tribute albums are essentially, what would you call them, like baskets of covers. That, that's the whole point in a, a tribute album. And we have a lot of bands recently putting out cover albums of their own. Motorhead did that recently. Um, Saxon did that recently. So, so this classic metal covers covers a lot of um, terrain. Did, did I leave anything out, Scott, in the stuff that we've been discussing? It's kind of hard for me to remember if we hit all of it. I mean, you know, we, we started to talk about um, something we haven't gotten to yet, but the distinction of why um, well, you know, uh, covering something that was by a metal band or some, or like Diamonds and Rust, that's something that's so far removed from metal that it's kind of a shock. Uh, but also we talked about kind of like throwing it in your live set versus putting it on your album. Right, right. So one of the things that we wanted to concentrate on, just so it doesn't sprawl into an unmanageable amount of stuff, is we wanted to give bands that made covers uh, central to their LPs, to their, to their albums, not live albums, not, not just bootlegs where they got up and they played some Led Zeppelin song or something like that, but where they said, this needs to be on the actual album. So um, we came up with a list for ourselves of a number 
of uh, covers. And I, Scott, you want to, do you want to read through the list? Uh, I've been talking a lot. <laughs> let me let me get, get it handy. Um, let's uh, let's start from the top, right? With yeah. uh, Judas Priest, Diamonds and Rust. Yep, the the Joan Baez. Yeah. Um, so as I was saying, that the Judas Priest version is the first version I heard from the live record when I was young. Um, and I didn't know it was a cover song. I don't know about other, you know, they, so they entered, I, I mean, I ended up knowing who Joan Baez was, but um, that's, a, that's, you know, it's kind of, that's a, a case of, I wonder why they, they chose that tune. You know, I wonder. We're going to get into that a little bit later yeah. on. Yeah. There's a whole backstory to that. Oh, well, I'll learn something. <laughs> yeah. So what about the next one? Uh, Chain of Fools, that's a head scratcher to me. Um, if I, you know, these are some of the things you're like, huh, a metal band and then an Aretha Franklin tune. Um, you know, all I picture is coming to a band meeting and somebody's, you know, it's like a, being in a metal band or something and somebody's saying, you know, we should really do sitting at the, sitting on the dock of the bay or something like that and saying, huh, why do you hear that? Why do you, yeah, that's what I mean by kind of a head scratcher. Now we'll, we're going to talk about that one a bit. There, that's a good example of a song that could really only have been done by that band um, in the current in the configuration that they had in I think around 1984. That's on the Honor album, um, and they probably couldn't have pulled it off as a power trio before. What's the next one? Uh, Megadeth, <laughs> Nancy Sinatra. These boots were made for walking. Uh, which is another, you know, uh, you know, is that, is that a head scratcher for you or it, 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 it's it, well, the first thing is a first impression I would say, is this tongue in cheek? Is this, uh, or are they, you know, are they serious about it? Or, you know, the first question I would have is what was the reasoning behind it? And then listen to it to see if it was kind of a, you know, it's like when Ozzy does stay in alive that was kind of, to me, tongue in cheek, right? Yeah. Um, wouldn't it be funny if, you know, um, because though, yeah, that's such a disco cultural song, right? In this case though, it really does work. It, and I'd say that too about Chain of Fools, they get turned into really heavy songs. Um, there's something about taking over that melodic progression that brought out things that were in the song, but other people weren't realizing, you could say. There's something about bringing a metal, what would you call it? Um, a metal approach to it. I mean, help me out here, Scott, a, a metal attitude to it. Um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, you could take the general chord progression. I mean, this is what a producer does. What a producer does is they'll take a set of chords and a lyric, lyrics and melody and then what they'll do is they'll put it together so um you know like a lot of times uh, i'm doing a, an album now with uh, a synth pop uh, producer and she'll show me you know here's this song that i did it's the more dismal version here's the dance mix version but it's the okay. same set of chords it's the same so uh, essentially you know you could take put the producer's hat on and go well the lyrics work in this sense for what we do or not and or so it's like well if we have some heavier guitar and change the riff a bit it fits in perfectly with what we do so it's kind of you just take the the core of what the song is and then you know, you put the, the the groups or the individual sound to it. So, yeah, I would say that's more of a, I would put that under a producer's hat. Um, well, that kind of fits in with the next one on the list as well then, right? And now we're starting to get away from things that are not directly, let's say, rock related. Uh, although, you know, Chain of Fools, okay, it's R&B. Um, yep. When we look at Judas Priest, the Green Man Alishi, we're now definitely in rock territory, but it's a very, very different song, isn't it? Yeah. Than, than what Fleetwood Mac was doing. Yeah, and that's an interesting one, too. It's just, you know, you got to take a band like, make a distinction, you know, Priest was starting in, you know, in the 70s, mm -hmm. as opposed to a band that started in the 90s that's metal. I mean, remember, I think we pointed this out last time, 
before this stuff happened, all these singers had records that weren't metal or they grew up with stuff that wasn't metal. Um, That's right. There wasn't as much of a legacy. We can say that, that by the eighties um, we see bands explicitly saying, well, we're being influenced by all these other metal bands like Iron Maiden or Judas Priest or Motorhead. Um, I mean, you could say with Iron Maiden, there's a looking backward to um, on the part of, Bruce Dickinson explicitly to Ian Gillen and on the part of yeah. um, um, Steve Harris to, to Pete Way, you know. Um, so already by the very late 70s, there's that influence going on. Yeah. Yep. And so maybe, what, yeah, go, go ahead. I was going to say the, the, the next one that we have is Van Halen, You Really Got Me, which was a kink song. And uh, that became a number one hit for Van Halen. And it's, it's an important part of their repertoire. We're going to talk about why Van Halen was doing covers so much in just a bit as we get through our list. Um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good distinction right there. Yeah. Let's, let, let's move on to the next one. Um, we're at Wasp, right? The Who tune. Yeah, The Real Me. Um, this is a this is a really good cover, but now we've got a band like the Kinks, where it's a hard, it's a definitely a hard rock band. It's not a metal band, but it's the sort of right. thing that metal heads are listening to, right? Right. And then there's one that you definitely wanted in there, the White Snake song. Yeah, right. You know, because David Coverdale did really, um, you know, it's a Bobby Blue Bland song, and um, he definitely came from. If you asked him, he definitely came from the Soul Singers. That was his thing. So I think those records he probably grew up with. And I think, you know, he, what, what was the first White Snake album that was on? Um, it was an early, well, he did it really early on when, you know, yeah. for John Sykes and everything. And, um, but they still keep it in the, in the set. And it became kind of a staple for when David Coverdale sings. And since White Snake is David Coverdale's band. Um, yeah. It, well, it's kind of like, you really got me with Van Halen. It just became, you know, almost a white snake song in the sense that well or or diamonds and rust attained that status too right oh um, god yeah well I, I think a lot of people showing i mean when judas priest are in concert rob halford always mentions that it is a cover song <laughs> because i think a lot of people in the audience probably don't know not now i mean maybe back in the day when it came out maybe people you know were would tend to have albums by different genres you know they might have a jazz <laughs> record they might have a um when the when the genres are kind of spread out and you know remember yeah, yeah. you know remember again rock and roll wasn't around that long in the 70s you know by the 70s we're, we may be looking at 10 years or so so, so uh, another one that i particularly liked and this is one where people brought it up in in comments when we were looking for you know ideas and information um aerosmith has a version of a song that's been covered by many many people and a lot of people were were plumping for the the motorhead version which i do like and i, I you know motorhead has some really great covers I think the Aerosmith cover of Train Kept a Rollin' All Night Long is more of a definitive cover. It's, um, it's really, it, it, you know, and the people might say, well, Aerosmith, is that really metal? Aerosmith isn't necessarily metal all the time, but that song is 1970s metal. It has some of the key traits that we would be looking for in it. Um, the, you know, the sort of crunchy sound. Um, there's a lot of great guitar soloing in it. it. It's got a real edge to it, a hardness to it. And I, I, my, my personal feeling, and I'd be interested to see what other people think, I think it's superior to the Motorhead version myself. What do you think, Scott? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. It became kind of a, well, you know, that's a tune that people still want to hear in the Aerosmith set. That's saying something, as opposed to if a- That's if, true. Yeah, you know, given sort of, the amount of changes that have happened. Um, with White Snake, to pick up one of the other bands, okay, so White Snake has changed, obviously, over time, but it's- it's, it's not as radical a departure from where they were in the early, or I mean, the late seventies after David Coverdale is out of, um, uh, um, <laughs> I'm blanking on it, not, not Black Sabbath, uh, Deep Purple. Deep Purple, um, yeah. 
Yeah, where he's made his bones and he forms his own band, right? It makes sense that the set list would stay pretty, pretty constant. But if Aerosmith is still including it in their set lists after all the transformations they've gone through, you know. That yeah, really and, 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 and fans want it. You know, it's not like, you know, um, well, let's take a, a non metal metal band like Heart, where early on they did rock and roll by Led Zeppelin on one of their albums. And I don't know any fans that want to hear that in the Heart set. They want to hear Heart songs. Like they, they're, they're, they're not a band that they did all these Led Zeppelin covers, but, you know, I don't know many people that want to hear that. They didn't become part of the band. Like the band didn't have a help in making the song their own or, you know, where Train Kept a Rollin' was, you know, that's, yeah. on their, that's on their first album, right? 71. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that became a... Um, yeah, I still hear people like say, saying, cool, they played Tra Train Kept a Rolling. And I don't know if some people d realize it's a cover, but, uh, you know, it's it's an Aerosmith tune to a lot of people or they made it their own. Yeah, and it, and it is from a time when they were probably heavier than they they are in the you know 80s going forward. Well, yeah, well, they weren't really writing a lot of their stuff in the 80s. Um, that was Diane. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, Diane Warren was writing like the movie soundtrack stuff and the, you know, you had a lot of famous producers like Desmond Child involved and, um, you know, they were changing with the times. Okay. So um, I guess maybe like Kiss did. Um, well, that's a band that's gone through a lot of uh, blowing in the wind, right? <laughs> <laughs> Embracing disco, um, going to a somewhat lighter rock sound in the 80s for a while taking the masks off, putting them back on. Um, there's a lot that, I mean, we could do a whole episode on Kiss, I think, in, in many we respects. Could. Yeah, absolutely. Now, another one that, that you really wanted in the list is Def Leppard's Action, which is a sweet song. Why, why that particular cover? Uh, that's been covered by a lot of people as well, right? Uh, yeah, but um, notice Phil Collin plays that rhythm right. And Phil Collin, for those that don't know, came from a glam band called Girl. And, okay. you know, he wore makeup and, you know, it was a, you know, glam. And then, you know, he got this opportunity to play on Def Leppard's Pyromania because the guitarist was a, a complete drunk. Um, why am I forgetting his name? Um, but anyways, Phil Collins only on half of that album. But that's definitely, I feel like they chose it. And I know Phil Collin is a huge Sweet fan. I mean, you know, for the glam rock stuff, it is pretty amazing. I love Sweet. And when they play it, even with his sound, you can tell he gets it. And um, they rock that song. I mean, it's, you know, so I feel, I feel like there was integrity in choosing it on their part. And, you know, you know, it's Phil Collins, you know, tip to his roots, you know, clearly. And there's, there's something about that rhythm and that downstroke, like kind of punk, punkish kind of okay. rhythm that you wouldn't think phil collin but like he comes from that and he can he can throw that rhythm down like you know like he's comes from that style which is interesting because you think of the album hysteria or something you're not hearing really any of that yeah so i just thought and i think it's a great tune and i think they sound great when they play it it's not like oh what a letdown you know it's, it's like kind of yeah. like get that kind of spirit from it so a last uh song on this top 10 suggestions for great classic metal tunes. It might seem kind of weird to, I think, some people. Yeah. And the very first time that I saw it, I was like, you got to be kidding me. And <laughs> I had Scott listen to it yesterday because it's a Christopher Cross song that's being covered. I mean, you know, covering something by Joan Baez or Aretha Franklin or Nancy Sinatra, things that are way outside of the, the mainstream of hard rock, um, that's that's one thing. Christopher Cross is probably, you know, the softest of soft rock, right? So um, Saxon did a version of Ride Like the Wind, and it really does rock. It's, it's great metal. Um, it's not the hardest thing Saxon has ever done, but it, no, it but, comes across. I mean, well, go ahead, Scott. I mean, so uh, I said this to Greg as a response, because I listened to it, because I said the same thing when Greg you know, told me about it. I, I said, you know, you gotta be kidding me. Right. So I go to it and it starts off the intro. It's metal. And I'm not sure what tune it is, but then you listen to the lyrics and the lyrics are metal. The lyrics are, you know, if you listen to the ride, like the wind, you know, 
you know, about this rebel yeah. carried a gun that's, you know, got to run, you know, is on, is completely on the run for, from authorities and everything. And the lyric content. And then I joked and I said, wow, Christopher Cross is pretty metal. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> Surprisingly so, right? And, and I think we can say similar things with what happens with these other songs that are being transformed like Diamonds and Rust or Chain of Fools. One reason why I like Chain of Fools so much is as a, um, you know, Detroit R&B song, it winds up being something that fits in metal really well. It, you can set down a great uh, bass line with it. Um, you can solo over it. The lyrics themselves fit in quite well. So I, I, so that brings us to some of the deeper questions that we, we wanted to engage in with this. Um, you know, what makes a really good classic metal cover song and what makes for a bad one? Um, how does a band make a song their own? That's something that I'm hoping Scott can really inform us on as a musician. There's a deeper metaphysical question. Um, what is a song as an entity or as an essence? When we say that this particular song, let, let's take one of the songs that's been covered over and over and over again, um, Born to be Wild. It's been yeah. covered by, by Raven with Udo singing, Udo Dirkschneider by the band Riot, um, by Slayer, by Ozzy, apparently with Miss Piggy. I'm not sure what the context with that was, by Blue Oyster Cult, by Crocus. Those are just the metal bands that have covered it. Like dozens of other bands have covered it. And, you know, I think all of us are familiar with it. It's, it's being used in commercials now for people getting motorcycle insurance, I think, from Geico. Um, <laughs> so, you know, Born to be Wild, we all know the, the, the song. What is, and here's where I want Scott to, to take a stab at this. When, when a song is covered this much, what is the actual song? What, what is the common thread or essence that they have through? Is it just the musical progression, the riffs and the lyrics together? And then anything you want to do with that, you can do? Or are there limits to how far you can push it with it being the same song? Mm. Well, okay. So if you go to other genres, like take jazz, for example. Um, if, if anybody knows, um, you know, a lot of the early, you know, bebop players and like even Miles Davis, they just took songs off the radio and used that as their um, springboard for improvisation. So and then Herbie Hancock did it in the 90s with the new standard. He, he covered Nirvana tunes. He covered Stevie Wonder tunes, Prince tunes. And the idea is the melodies there enough that a layman can understand it. But they can mess with the harmony. They can mess with, you know, the time, the form in a big way. But when you've got metal, <clears throat> the form has to be like, uh, you can mess with it. Like if we, if you want to go to um, the Saxon version of Ride Like the Wind, they put a heavy guitar riff before that interlude section. You know, da, 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 da. Right. Da, da. So it, <clears throat> they were able to kind of like, you know, I, I was like, oh, are they going to leave that out? Because that's the, that part's not metal but then they ended up making it a cool riff um, on the guitar riff. And um, you're saying like kind of what, what you should consider if you're going to make it your own. Well, that, yeah. If, to, to genuinely do that. I mean, I think there are some cover songs where you're like, eh, this doesn't really work as a cover song. I mean, I get what you're doing, but this is inferior to other covers or the original song, you know? It's, yeah, it could be the producers. It could be, but I mean, if it's <clears throat> let's take producers and record companies out of it, you know, okay. where, where if you you it's like TV shows, you you bring the, the the script and they'll go, you have to take this out. You have you can't put this on TV. You can't do, you know, um, you know, it's going to be up down to creativity. Um, you know, like the bands that do direct covers, you know, um, yeah, where it's like exactly like it, but you know, you're not that kind of player. Then it could. Uh, come off as insincere to the listener i think that's what it comes down to are you connecting with your audience on it and it's you don't have to know anything about music if you have a band you love and they put out something that you feel is insincere yeah um and you might be a really good judge of character on this like you know in the past when i was younger i'd get, you know get these albums and they have filler in it i knew what the filler was because it's like oh, we, got this <laughs> songs. we got another week we're gonna put some silly track you know, it's like, you know, the Beatles used to do it with like, you know, you know, my name, look up the number, 
And that was just like a big joke they did for like five minutes. And well, you know, this is this is a total digression here, and it's not a cover song, although I think it has probably been covered by a lot of people in bars. Warren's Cherry Pie was exactly that kind of song. It was something to fill up a little space on the album. They had, you know, they, they were under contract. And so they like knocked it out real quick. And they're like, yeah, hey, who's going to listen to this crap? And as it turned out, that was, you know, their number one hit. And that's what people still are demanding of them. And they don't like playing it. <laughs> because <laughs> That's you're right. And, you know, that, um, that's the album with Un Uncle Tom's Cabin on it, which was a killer tune. And that was like, you know, way below Cherry Pie on the MTV playlist. Yeah. Um, that's that's a whole other thing. You know, what if I'm trying to think bands that do cover songs and that becomes the fan favorite is is maybe a little disappointing. Yeah. You know? um, I would think even well, if you were serious about the cover. There's an interesting comment here by uh, Jeremiah about sort of going the other way. Tori Amos is raining blood. Uh, is entirely different from the original, also excellent. And, and I, I got to see her here, actually, here in Milwaukee, um, playing in concert, and she was doing covers of, like, Nirvana songs and stuff like that back oh, then really? in the 90s. Yeah. And, you know, of course, it's going to be different because she's using as her main instrument a piano and her, her voice. Um, and I think we can say similar things, too, like the Cardigans did a version of uh, Black Sabbath's War Pigs, which you know it's not going to be metal when they're doing it right and so there, there's kind of a back and forth that that goes on it's interesting because i don't think that in the time period that we're primarily looking at 70s and 80s that there's a lot of non-metal covers of metal songs whereas there are a lot of metal covers of non-metal songs but then like from the 90s onward we do see a lot of um, non-metal covers in whether it be singer songwriter like uh, Tori Amos or whether it be pop like the, the Cardigans or, you know, a lot, a lot of um, use of metal riffs in um, hip hop and rap as well. Right. Think about Jamie, Jamie's crying. So that oh, would, that, yeah. that would be an exception actually. That's not a cover, but that's a sampling sample. Yeah. A good, before things got a lot tighter in terms of copyright, um, a lot of hip hop and rap was using metal riffs or, or hooks for um, raw material, right? Yeah. Or how many times has, have, has um, I Can't Go For That by Hall & Oates been sampled? Oh, I mean, right, right. Countless. I, ca I can't count it. Even Simply Red did that with, with that riff. Yeah. Surprising. Well, so come, coming back to this this question, is is there something like an essence to a song? Is if there is, is it just the melody, the main riffs, or you know what's going on with the rhythm section or the lyrics? Um, does that you know that's what allows us to identify a cover as a cover? Oh, I see what you mean. Um, in other words, you you're saying we know the song already. Well. We well, know the song already, but then, like, uh, what are they doing to it? That's can it be so different that we it's unrecognizable? That's yeah, that's that's a good question. So let's let's take some um, examples, right? We do say that "Diamonds and Rust" is a cover song. Yeah, um, and is that because the lyrics are the same? Only half of the lyrics are actually used in the Judas Priest song. They left out, you know, most of the verses. Um, it's not because of what's going on with the drumming or the bass, right? And there is a chord progression, and the chord, the chord progression is the same. The same. Yeah. But uh, um, on the original, it's this kind of cool finger style folk, and they had they would have an opportunity because I'm I was listening to it again because it's been a while. I listened to it for this, the Joan Baez version, and I'm like, well, you know, they could have done like not a power ballad but they could mm -hmm. have done um, some kind of metal intro with those, that same arpeggiation. Okay. Um, and then gone heavy, but um, you know, obviously they start off heavy and you don't know what song it is, but if you already knew the song, you know, when the lyrics and the melody come in. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of like, what's this, this is kind of a cool riff. And then the melody comes in, you know, and if, if a cover 
a lot of us are introduced to some of these songs through their covers. Um, a great example of this would be Metallica's Am I Evil, which was a B-side cover that uh, got thrown in. Um, trying to remember exactly what, uh, here it is. Um, it, which, which um, wow, it, it, was, it was on, I think, Creeping Death, perhaps. And it, it really took off because Metallica was like going like gangbusters at that time. And Diamond Head, who they had covered, was, you know, kind of in, in decline, let's say. People were not paying all that much attention uh, to them at that point in time. And so a lot of people got to um, learn the song through, um, through the Metallica cover. And then that led to Diamond Head getting booed when they did it on stage. Because they they were they had a, a bunch of people who thought that they were just ripping off Metallica, when it was exactly the opposite. And Metallica had to go on and explain, no, no, we we've covered this. Um, now it, after after that, a lot of people went back and listened to the Diamond Head version, and they've actually said it was. I should go down to this interview. They were asked, well, did you you know did it bother you that Metallica covered your your thing, Diamond Head said, well, no, that's actually kept us alive financially because we, we get the um, money coming to us from having done that, that cover. Um, royalties are allowing the band to continue. Um, so that's, you know, there's something nice to, about that. Um, Mark has a good question here. Do you think there are different expectations for what would constitute a good cover, depending on whether it's covered live or recorded? And I think the answer to that is absolutely yes, right? If you're putting it on an LP, you are making a statement. We are standing behind this yeah. song. It's not the same thing as getting up on stage and saying, hey, uh, you like this song? Let's play it for you right now. Maybe we won't play it next, next set or something like that. I, what do you think, Scott? No, I agree with that. If you're going to put it, well, you know, and I, I guess it happens less nowadays, but certainly in the seventies and eighties, there would be that filler thing. All right. Just, we, we all used to play this in the bar, you know, let's do roadhouse blues. Um, and, um, you know, uh, but live, you know, you could get away with it. Cause you know, like towards the end of the show, you know, the crowd's getting riled up and then you do something that everybody knows, and then you come back with your encore and do two more. So, yeah. Uh, so um, let's let's talk about some of these other issues. Um, you mentioned songs that are bad covers, right? What, what would be some examples of those for you? Well, um, of course, I'm a well, you know, I'm a big Bloister Cult fan. Um, and there is a, a really famous live album. Yeah. Called Some Enchanted Evening. And uh, I loved it. And, and the problem is it was the Spectres tour, which is one of one of their top albums in my book. But they had a few covers on it. And a lot of people hate the kick out the jams, but I don't know why they did the animals. We got to get out of this place like that was, you know, I remember even as a kid, like I'd go to the record player and take the needle off. It was just oh, like, really, it was just a bad song. And then like them doing it, it was just uh like kick out the jams was at least rocking and you get the crowd going with it, but it's a tune that they didn't record on an album, but they included in their live album. Okay. And so this would go to that question about, uh, are there different standards, yeah. different. Well, here's levels. the thing about that show is the LP was only about 40 minutes long total, but the show was 90 minutes. So they took out some prime stuff from specters that they performed. They took out all this stuff and um, they said, well, we can only keep about half of the show. And half of that show was including two cover songs. Yeah. And now looking back, that's like, well, that's, that's interesting. I wonder who decided that. And I should, I should ask Buck. I mean, who decided? And they did that on another, uh, their, their other live, live album, Born to be Wild was on it. And, you know, maybe you en end with the song just as a, everybody's like, you know, rocking out, but to put it on your live album and take out your own original material, yeah, as a fan, I don't like that, but that's personal. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a difference between doing a cover that you've already got on your LP on your live album, like Kisses 20,000, uh, uh, or is it 2000 Century Man? Um, that's a cover, right? So, and that, that appears, they've got a couple other covers, 
but well, or, or, you know, again, when, when Judas Priest does um, Diamonds and Rust or Green Man Alishi or Better By You, Better Than Me, those are things off the LP that show up there. Um, and they're not on B-sides either. They are, they're definitely committed to. Oh, that's, I mean, a, that's an interesting point. I mean, side thing. Yeah. yeah. Should, should we say that B-sides are at like a lower level, sort of like in between live stuff and an actual LP? I don't know, because I don't know, in, maybe other people can chime in um, if they can get past Sally's uh, yeah. great uh, contribution to the uh, conversation. But when I used to buy B-side, sorry, 45s, um, I'm old enough to have purchased 45s. And the B-side usually had a song I liked better by the band. And then I would buy the album because it's like, okay. But when the B-side had a cover song that wasn't on the album, it, um, that wasn't enticing right it i mean from a marketing perspective but I, I wonder if i'm the only one that was kind of like um well the maiden that came out in their their box set right they had the the um big eddie uh it was the somewhere in time box set and they had all these kind of they had some covers they had some stuff that they did yeah. on the album um well, yeah you know, that that's iron maiden is kind of a great example there they didn't do any covers as far as I know on any of the LPs, no. but they have a lot of B sides that are covers and they've been doing that from pretty early on. Um, as a matter of fact, there's some where it's uh, both singers. So for example, um, Montrose's I've got the fire shows up as a B side for sanctuary with Paul Diano. Right. So you get to hear one version of it there. And then they redid it um, as the B side for Flight of Icarus off of the Peace of Mind album. By then, um, Bruce Dickinson had been yeah. in for quite a while. So you got two different singers covering the same uh, song. Um, Mark says, one of my favorite memories is hearing Iron Maiden play a UFO's Doctor Doctor as part of their warm up. Um, yeah. Cool. I mean, and again, um, that's because Steve Harris really loves Pete Way and UFO so much, um, so much so. Actually, do you do you want to tell this uh, story? You know, Pete Way. If you don't know this music oh, yeah. history, he <laughs> left UFO, and it was around the same time as Fast Eddie Clark left Motorhead. And there's a whole story about that as well. That also has to do with covers, uh, which we could talk about a little bit later on. And so they were going to get together and form a super group called Fast Way. And then it turned out that that Pete Way couldn't do it. And so Fast Eddie Clark did it. He, he got some other people and they, they managed to bring out a couple pretty good albums in the, in the 1980s. So Pete Way instead formed a band called Wasted, W-A-Y-S-T-D, you know. D, yeah. Typical kind of, you know, metal spelling of stuff or, you know, misspelling of things. And Wasted never really made it I would even say past like the third tier. I wouldn't even call them a second tier metal band. They've got a couple good songs. They made it onto Metal Killers collection, but none of their stuff is really great. But Steve Harris really, really, really liked Steve Way's work and kind of looked up to him. And so now here's where I'm going to turn it over to Scott because he got to see some of the fruits of this. So um, I'm going to I'm going to go back to the part you haven't heard. Um, okay. So. I, I was in high school at the time. This is 86 when Somewhere in Time came out. And um, a science teacher was going to demonstrate how a, a needle works. So we all took like a, a threading needle and, you know, just a, a paper cone and we'd spin a record and play it. And it was a wasted record. I, I've never heard of it. So I'm trying to listen to it. But we kind of like being mischievous, we got into his back room and he had a stack of wasted albums. Wow. And it turns out that like his nephew or something had to do with the road crew or something so so my friend and i each took one so i listened to the band and they were like i would say it was kind of more like survivor it was like really cool pop rock yeah and um but i'm like pete way from ufo that doesn't work i show up to see the maiden show maybe a month later and wasted his opening and i'm like oh this is cool you know i like these songs right it's like third song in and they're, they're just being booed the whole time. Oh yeah. And um, then they left stage and Steve Harris came out and like read the riot act. 
And, you know, he was just like, that's a legend. And, you know, he's, I, you, you wouldn't have me if it wasn't for him. And it was, you know, at the time I was just like, oh my God, like what's going on? And everybody got quiet, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it was unusual. I mean, it's great that he came out to, to do it rather than Bruce, who you'd expect to come yell at everyone. Yeah. Because I've, I've had Bruce, you know, Bruce has yelled at the crowd many times and I'm on his side most of the time, you know, he's an airline pilot and people are smoking pot, but he has to take drug tests to be an airline pilot. And if they find pot in his system. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I actually, I'll go on a digression at Monsters of Rock. And this would have been 1988 when I was just um, graduating from high school. It was in Alpine Valley and Alpine Valley. Um, is one of those outside music venues that um, fell onto hard times, like went under for a while. Now it's back again. And in the eighties, it was like the place to go see bands because it was in a Valley, uh, a natural Valley. So there's like a, you know, an actual band shell with all the seats. And then there were all these lawn seats and there, there wasn't a single bad lawn seat. You could actually see quite well. And people would get drunk and high and, you know, all sorts of things going on. And, Monsters of Rock is a long thing, right? It, it, it was, um, I forget who the opening band was, but it, they almost got booed off the stage because we wanted to see the others. Um, it wasn't, it, it might've been Kingdom Come, um, but okay. then it was like, you know, Metallica, the Scorpions, um, Dokken. Dokken, yeah. And then finally it was Van Halen. And there was like a little bit of a delay or something and people were throwing around beach balls. And so that, that's cool. And then people started pulling up sod like big giant pieces of sod, you know, this thick and throwing them around. <laughs> and, and so the concert venue was not happy about that, but you know, it's rock and roll, right? Um, but then people were getting hit in the head with these, these giant pieces of sod. And so Sammy Hagar came out and he was like yelling at the crowd and you, you, this is not the way to, you know, to rock and roll and, and stuff like that. And people are like, who the hell are you to tell us what, you know, what rock and roll is, you know, you're, 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 you know, kind of getting, uh, what would be the, the, you know, you're, you're, you're out of touch. Right. Um, and, and to, you know, Sammy Hagar had been around for quite a long time. You know, uh, he was, he was rocking with Montrose before Van Halen were even organized as, as a group. Right. Um, but that was kind of funny to see him haranguing the crowd. You know, there's a certain tension that gets set up when, when that happens. Yeah. I mean, uh, the whole, well, the, the somewhere in time tour, I'll never forget walking through and iron maiden had put signs everywhere pleading with the fans not to destroy anything oh interesting and it was kind of like you know if you want us to come back to your town you won't destroy the bathrooms you won't spray paint you won't wow. throw seats you won't throw beers at people and i remember at that time just going wow i mean they must have threats from venues going you know if your audience we won't bring you back but I remember it being like every two feet at the merch stand it, where the bathrooms were going into the venue. It's yeah. So, so that's, uh, but you know, I, I've never known, do you, have you ever known Iron Maiden to do a cover, cover song live? I've never seen it. Um, but that, that certainly doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. Um, but I, there, there, this is a good point. There are some bands who do a lot more cover stuff and there's a lot of bands who, who don't. And, and some of it could be just a temperament. They don't want to do it. They've got enough material in their catalog. Um, but some of it could also be how they developed. You know, so if we take Van Halen, for example, before. before Van Halen really made it big, they were one of the best cover bands in the LA area. And they, that's how they, in fact, made it big. That's how they made a lot of money. That's how they um, drew audiences. They would be in these parties and they would be expected to be doing cover songs. And they had to fight to get their own material um, in there. And, and some of the venues that they would go to were cool with them playing their own original material. And some of them were like, you're not here to play House of, uh, uh, what is it, House of Pain was, or uh, one of their early ones, of course, you know, running with the devil, things like that. Um, I mean, these guys put together a 25 song demo when they were invited to do it. So they clearly had a vast range, but um, they were worried about getting pegged as a band that was only going to do covers. Um, but, you know, look at what they chose to make one of their first singles, a, a kink song, the a kink cover song. song. Yeah. 
Which now let me ask you, Scott, um, do you think the Van Halen version is actually better than the Kinks version? Uh, or would you say they're about the same? Or would you say the Kinks version is better? Uh, that's a tough one because that's an example of it, it, it's still Van Halen. It's a kink song, but it's it's I mean, you know, mostly Eddie. There's no mistaking Eddie. Well, and David Lee Roth's voice. Right, right, or David Lee Roth's voice. So yes, it's a cover, but it you know, the reason it was played on the radio all the time, yeah. I, mean, it, I mean, still it's played on classic rock stations, is it was so them. It was. It didn't sound yeah. like contrived, and you know, it fit in with the rest of the album how it was recorded. It didn't sound like it was recorded on a different day with different gear, or yeah, you know, it just kind of sounded like part of their session, and they did it convincingly. This goes back to that that thing about bad cover songs, um, and one of the ones that I think is particularly egregiously bad is Judas Priest, Johnny Be Good. Oh God, stop! Um, and, and and it fits all the criteria that you were just talking about. It, you know, does it sound like them? Yes, it sounds like them, but it sounds like them screwing off and playing something that doesn't fit at all. They they didn't make it their own, or if they did, they made it their own in ways that just didn't didn't come across, you know? Yeah, um, and like, you know, it, Jeremiah has a good point, Guns N' Roses, too, you know, relying on covers. But you know what's funny about that is, I, I totally agree with that because um, after Appetite did so well, I think what happened is the record company said, okay, you have three months to make a new album. Mm. And th that might have been, been something- I, that And two of them got consumed with partying. <laughs> Well, you know, they, they took pride in showing up two hours late. Um, you know, that's that's just, yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, I wonder, because I know bands were like, well, we know Kiss. You know, Ace wouldn't show up to the sessions. Yeah. He got drunk, passed out somewhere. So Robin Ford's playing on some of the albums. or, um, But, you know, uh, and I, you know, I didn't even think about Guns N' Roses because we could consider them, they're more like... <sighs> Uh, do we consider them metal? I mean, they're metalish riffs, but they're kind of like in the tradition of Aeros, 70s Aerosmith. I mean, they were they were what was getting called metal in the late 80s. So I would say so. I know? would say so. And the first album I thought was great, but you know, their covers were were pretty bad. You know, you know, yeah. like Live and Let Die was like, you know, even it came on empty. But why? Why are you doing Live and Let Die? You know, well, this this brings up a good point. Do you think there's some bands that whose whose music is harder to cover? I mean, another great Beatles um, hard edge thing is is Helter Skelter, right? And Motley yeah. Crue's um, Helter Skelter on Shout at the Devil. It's pretty good. Mm. It doesn't make it into the, like that top tier of of metal covers, I would say um it definitely sounds like them but it sounds like all the other songs i would say on that album which is is in fact you know uh, that's where i think motley crew was making their best music um yeah shout at the devil yeah i mean what they did on the next album with smoking in the boys room i would say is more theirs than that beatles song that they were doing you know, I, I remember they had a huge hit with smoking in the boys room and that was on the radio a lot. And I remember That's right, yeah. cover metal bands like in high schools were all doing the the crew version of that tune. And that was kind of like, you know, to kids in high school, that was a crew tune as far as they, <laughs> they were concerned. You know, they didn't know it was a song for the 50s or whatever. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I mean, that is that is an issue that comes up with with uh this whole phenomenon of, of covering is how do fans, I mentioned the Metallica and Diamond Head thing, how do fans get to know who actually um, originated the song? Well, you know, back with vinyl, at least, when, when we bought tapes of vinyl, when we listened to the album, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't on in the background as much as, you know, if somebody puts their phone on in the background. But, you know, we often read through the thing and it would say, who wrote it or you know or you notice if it was like a, a different publishing company because every publishing company has different names so sometimes you know you'd get the record and you look you're like no kidding it's not their song and you know um they would always say um if there was a guest musician you know um courtesy of columbia records but this is an epic al epic records album yeah yeah but a lot of times if you had the um 
and sometimes in the liner notes they'd say you might notice the inclusion of whatever um it's harder to tell these days with the digital age i guess but um, well it, it's harder and easier in a way because when we would get like an album or a tape and it would have somebody else's names as the writers if you didn't know who the hell these people were, you wouldn't associate them with the band that it came from. And you would have to do some digging around, you know, without the internet there to like immediately Google um, who Brian Tatler is. You wouldn't know um, that a song is by Diamond Head, right? You just know it's this guy, Tatler, and Metallica's covered it. So who, who's this, you know? Um, whereas yeah. now there's lots more, there's a lot more covers and we can easily look up the information but i think there's also like quite a few people who hear covers and they don't realize that they actually are covers because they don't know we could call it the canon or whatever whatever fancy term we want to have for having had a long you know uh listening history if somebody's you know 18 years old you can't expect them to have had the, the listening history of somebody who's 40 years old right well that yeah well like i said when i was younger i thought you know, that uh, I thought uh, the Joan Baez song was a priest song when I was younger. You know, yeah. I just, you know, I, it, it, because it, it sounded like them. It's not like they tried to do the same. Right. Thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, so I, I do have some things that I, I dug up um, about that particular song. So I'm going to read some of this to you. Halford in an in interview was saying it's a vivid memory. Here's the thing. Judas Priest were just starting to get some kind of traction in America and the label had suggested to us we might want to consider doing a cover song to see if we could make some kind of entrance into the glorious American rock and roll radio scene. So Priest then and Priest now has always been very open minded to any opportunity to spread the gospel of Judas Priest metal. So we said, yeah, send anything and we're ready to hear whatever you've got. So that sounds pretty good so far, right? You know, okay plausible uh market strategy yeah so they send diamonds and rust he says the first time we heard that song we we're in a little studio in south wales this 45 single came in the mail registered delivery from the label this is the label's idea that they should they should cover this song we take it out there it is a 45 single joan Di joan baez diamonds and rust we go into the studio and open up an old record player and put the single on the top and press start and watch it drop and the needle go and then the music starts now bear in mind we all know who joan baez is we're all aware she's a very very famous lady famous musician famous activist but we have no idea what's going to come through the speakers so when we first hear Joan, simply Joan and her acoustic guitar singing the opening lines, I'll be damned, here comes your ghost again, we all looked at each other. And the initial gut feeling was, this can't be right. This isn't heavy metal. How can this be turned into a heavy metal experience? But then as the song moved on, I think it was a, like a bit of epiphany for Judas Priest. Because at that moment, we understood that a great song, as is the case with Joan Baez, Diamonds and Rust, will take any kind of translation any kind of changing direction, changing sound, however you want to describe it. So then it became for us um, a real fun, interesting experience of taking this very beautiful, very fragile song and making it into this big metal monster, which it still is for, for Judas Priest. That's a very interesting set of uh, observations on Halford, who's, who's you know, a smart guy um, yeah. on his part that maybe there's some songs, not all songs, but some songs where they have enough malleability. There's enough something there that can be turned into something else, you know? And, and again, I would say that what Tank did with Chain of Fools uh, fits that bill. Um, Saxons ride like the wind, you know? um well i think that's a perfect translation that tank because you know the lyrics alone and the progression you know the the the, the progression that you just change, change the groove a little bit mm -hmm. you know but they didn't have that you know that keyboard riff they just had the chords with a metal with i think it was a it was like a gallop right yeah basically so you put yeah. the metal gallop and um the rhythm of the melody fit fits a gallop groove just fine yeah. so you've got the I, lyric content and you've got you know the chord progression is not something that it wasn't like a... you're a little you're a little frozen on on my end so 
I'm going to take this this moment uh, while Scott is uh, sorting out the internet stuff on, on his side to mention that um, the tank thing I, I, I said earlier probably couldn't have been pulled off <clears throat> by the tank that was the original band with, which was a power trio, um, Algie Ward being the key person involved there. Um, the Brobs brothers ended up leaving, and then you have... Um, uh, Cliff uh, Evans and uh, Mick Tucker coming on as twin guitars. And you probably needed that in order to make it work. Oh, it looks like we might, might have lost Scott due to internet issues for a bit. So we'll see if he comes back in or not. And that's a, a prime example of a band that could only cover at a certain point, could only translate that song into something at a certain point. And we might say similar things about Van Halen. Maybe, you know, the Van Halen with David Lee Roth, there's certain things that they could pull off. And then there's other things that they, they couldn't pull off with uh, Sammy Hagar or anybody else later on. Maybe losing Michael Anthony would also be uh, something that would erode the ability to do covers like that. Um, so those are all um, significant issues, I would say. Um, let's see if we can get Scott back in here. I don't see camera for, there we go. Uh, all right. I didn't kick me off, so. <laughs> yeah, the internet gods uh, are, are capricious and cruel sometimes. So I was just talking a little bit more about that, that tank song. And then I, I spun off into thinking about, you know, um, other bands that maybe couldn't have pulled off a particular cover at mm -hmm. a, a given time, you know, like with Judas Priest, I think that we can say the, the whole era, they can do the, the covers. Um, but maybe some bands, the covers wouldn't, well, we talked about Aerosmith, right? Train kept a rolling that can be done the way it was done in the seventies when they're taking so much direction from other people, whether songwriting or production, maybe they can't. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, well, let's take somebody trying to cover Judas priest. Okay. Um, that's a bit of a challenge because Rob Halford has such a unique voice and a, such a unique way of phrasing that the melodies that he comes up with really suit his voice or the band. Um, or, yeah, I mean, it's uh, like I've I've played shows with priest songs with good singers, but it just wasn't the song to me. OK, so, you know, I've been in situations where like this is not the band to cover a priest song. Now, or, why? Why not? Can you like peel back the curtain a little bit on that or um, if it's, you know, part of the charm is, is how Halford sings, but. If you're not going to do that, you're going to have to put work into going, this is a great song. Um, you can use somebody with a different voice, but they're going to have to have to have a maybe a unique strength on their own. Okay. Pay this. Um, let's take like, okay, so take a band like Dire Straits, Mark Knopfler. You know, it's kind of mumbling, but he's singing. But, you know, if you're going to have uh, a clear uh, song of it, it wouldn't it wouldn't come across that well. Well, I mean, like if, if Judas Priest wanted to do Brothers in Arms or, or Money for Nothing. Okay. I mean, that would be kind of, might be funny. I mean, I, I, you know, you're taking something that's so characteristic to that song, like that part of the charm of Dire Straits is that Scottish blue collar kind of, you know, yeah. uh, sentiment. An ethos. Yeah. Exactly. That's the word I'm looking for. And, you know, uh, that's why I think the tank one works great. Just to add to our, the, to tie back, um bad covers i think one of the top bad covers is scorpions can't explain now why i mean i don't think it's a terrible cover i just think it's mediocre uh, uh, it's just, why do you think it's terrible they write such great stuff and they're shooting first of all doing a cover song i mean that was in what the was that the early 90s mid 90s yeah when they did that they weren't writing great stuff then but it was just kind of like and then they pushed it as a single because okay. like and, but it didn't really catch it never caught and i'm thinking you know here we are like you know you and i you know fans of uh love at first sting or love drive or, or or worldwide live which i wore out and then you you see the scorpions trying to push a bad <laughs> version of can't explain um yeah 
uh, maybe they would have gotten away with it if it was earlier in their career. Like the, you know, th- we want to kind of do a crossover thing, but it would have had a different sound to it though. That that's so again, like different versions of the band, the Scorpions lineup didn't change um, going from the eighties to the nineties, but their sound did change. Yeah. Um, Savage Amusement is it's okay as an album. There's some good songs on there, but it's not Blackout. It's not um, Love at First Sting. It's not Love Drive. It's not, um, you know, like you mentioned, the, the, the energy of Worldwide Live. It just sounded like a tired album. And a lot of their stuff since then just hasn't had the, the energy and vitality of uh, the earlier stuff, the hunger. You know. I love Savage Amusement, but here's what changed with that is for the first time they were playing with the 80s sounds on their guitars. And, you know, instead oh, of interesting. That, so anything before that was just straight through the Marshall. And okay. so, I'm, you know, I used to think, you know, at the time I loved it and I didn't notice it because, <laughs> you know, guitar sounds like that were all around me in that era or all around us. Yeah. Um, I, I would like to hear those songs done just through, through the Marshalls, the old way, because a lot of them have a good energy, a good, I thought it was a strong album, but the one after that, where it was, um, you know, it was kind of like the tired ballads. What was the album? Was it 1990? What, what am I thinking of with uh, the winds of change? Yeah. That, that's the only song I really remember off of it. And when I heard that, I was like, Ooh, this, you know, I get why they're doing it given the world historical moment that they're in, but this is, this is definitely not metal. <laughs> and you remember, this is the era where MTV was starting to say, you need to do the acoustic jam. When oh, that's Castle right. Heard. Yeah, yeah. So it was kind of like, I thought Queen's Reich was amazing. Their songs transferred to acoustic great because the melodies were great, the progressions. Mm-hmm. So you could take away the loud guitars and I thought they were one of the best ones. But then you take someone like Poison, you can't take away the kind of... New York Dolls punk rock thing because yeah. that's what it's about. And it's that dirty cool. guitar sound. Yeah. Yeah. And CC was great at that. He wrote great, you know, pop punk tunes. I mean, he he wrote a lot of the um <clears throat> Avril Lavigne songs. He ghost wrote for a lot of those kind of people. And um, but like, you know, you took a lot of those bands and then, you know, first of all, they weren't good acoustic players. And but some of the bands did it, but that was the era that like bands were trying, like it was after the power ballad, but in the acoustic jam part like Mm -hmm. tesla was the first one to do it i think the five man that's right yeah yeah and i think that that did well so everybody you know mtv said this is it we're gonna have everybody do acoustic for you know acoustic jams and well, they they insisted on that not just for metal bands but also i remember like stone temple pilot had had their version of creep that was acoustic and nirvana didn't they do like an unplugged version they did some of their stuff yeah so i think everybody had to to do unplugged unless you're a singer songwriter and you're already on you're already doing it yeah Yeah, that was that was not a great era i mean it was a But like Queen's Reich, I remember how I seen that thinking how great it, it was. And I listened to it a couple of years ago thinking great, great songs. You know, yeah. they, they're songs that can stand up to just singing with an acoustic guitar. And well, I- mentioning uh, Queen's Reich is a good opportunity to shift to something else that we were going to talk about in this, which is cover albums, which are a, a, a more recent phenomenon. I mean, Going back in the day, like if you look at the very first Deep Purple and Black Sabbath albums, they both contain covers. And it was kind of a, a thing back then to have a, at least a couple covers. So same thing with UFO, by the way. Their, their early stuff had a couple covers on it as well. Um, but cover albums, an album where you're just covering other people's stuff, wasn't being done so much in metal at that time i think there were other people who were doing that and it's become a big thing you could say like in the last 10 years or so um there's some that are kind of hard to say whether they really are cover albums or not like for example twisted sisters christmas album should we consider that to be a cover album i probably not i mean it's a metal album it, they are covers are they really metal covers i i don't know but but there i'll just read you the list of some of the recent ones right so there's the fozzy album from 2000 which is a, you know a kind of made-up band 
um, that's supposed to have gotten like stuck in Japan and could never get out of there. It's actually like a super group that was doing that project. And most of their stuff is, is covers. Um, Raven recently did Party Animals, um, which was part of their Kickstarter project. It was an extra thing. Overkill did a, a album called Cover Kill. Queensryche did Take Cover. You're starting to see a theme now, right? In the naming yeah. of them. Uh, Ozzy did Undercover. Motorhead did Under, if we pronounce it with the umlaut that it has, Under Coover, but it's actually Undercover. Saxon recently brought out something called Inspirations, which is all cover tunes as well. Um, Iron Maiden has one that's called Best of the B-Sides. Now, this is a good one to debate. So it's not all cover material. It, 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 the, a lot of the B-Sides are cover material. So bringing to get them together along with some original songs, is that really a cover album or not? Um, what do you think? Does it have to be all covers to be a cover album? Or well, it doesn't sound like the Iron Maiden's a dedicated cover album. So, like you pointed out, cover kill, yeah, um, you know, undercover. So these are clearly we've set out to do a cover. But when you take all your B sides and the, the B sides happen to be covers, okay, so that's that, an important distinction. Yeah, it's like a byproduct. The cover yeah. songs are a byproduct of the, the B sides being cover songs. It has to do with something like intentionality, or. Yeah. Um, I would say so, because that's a big deal when you do a covers album, rather than filling your out your album of originals with two covers. Mm -hmm. At least we know what you set out to do when you what you did that record. You know, and I'll point out that a lot of these recent covers are the bands having a fun time, you know, saying, oh, we, we really like these songs. That's why we're doing them. Um, so like Motorhead, their undercover has, um, you know, stuff like David Bowie on it. Um, or, you know, right. other things that are not, not metal oriented. Here's a good one for you. Um, so Whitesnake, their purple album, that is Deep Purple covers. But David Coverdale was a member of Deep Purple. Right. Is so, it a cover album or not? Is it a cover album? Um, the rest of the band aren't members of Deep Purple. Only, only David Coverdale, but he is the band leader. So... But he wasn't the band leader of Deep Purple. <laughs> no, and I'm wondering, you know, it's a good question. I should look into it. Did David Coverdale have writing credits in those songs he covered for the album? In other words, are Purple fans going to race out and buy it and there's going to be money in his bank account because... So the um, answer to that is yes for some of the songs, but not the majority of them. Uh, oh, really? So he, he did some songs that he didn't sing on and albums he wasn't on? Yeah, he, he like covered a, a wide range of, of stuff from Deep Purple, Mark II, Mark III, and Mark IV. Oh, you know, and it's funny because uh, I remember that coming out and having no interest in getting it. Um, Why was that? Because I'm thinking like, you know, um, there's times that, you know, and I could be wrong, people might disagree with me. There's times I look at it and go, okay, okay that was lazy. You know, that was like, you know, uh, you put this album together, you know, everybody that band knows the purple standards, you go in and you knock it out in a couple of days. Okay. You know, um, you know, didn't write new material. Although so, so that's interesting because one could say that doing a cover album by itself is kind of lazy because yeah. you're taking other people's things that have already been written. You don't have to go through the songwriting process. You're saying it's even in some respect lazier because these are your own standards already, <laughs> <laughs> right? Or am I misinterpreting you? No, you're no, you're you're right. And um, you know, here's the other thing because there's a trade-off. You know, these bands. You know, uh, I know Toto's not a, a metal band, but they did a, a covers album. And my first question is, well, you're going to spend money putting this album out. And you will make no money from it because you don't own the licensing. Mm -hmm. You don't own the songwriting. You, you don't own anything to do with these songs. So like when, you know, Halloween does a cover album, every album they sell, the money goes to the people that wrote the song or own the publishing. So I'm always interested, you know, in this day and age. What's, what's the motive for doing covers? Yeah. What's the motive for doing a covers album? And there's an answer that I don't know. And I'm, I should ask some of the people that have done that in their position why'd you do a covers album like you know oh it's fun yeah but it cost you money it, it, you know it cost you money and you put you know maybe 
maybe you want money to go into the pockets of your influences. That's cool. Um, yeah. In the case of White Snake, it's, you know, at least some of it, when he sells the full album, Coverdale, if he had writing credits and owns publishing, he's going to make money from it. I mean, I think you could say that about one of the early cover albums in the classic metal era, which would be Metallica's Garage Days Revisited, yeah. right? Um, they were, and Lars Ulrich, who is not a upstanding, great individual, you could say from all sorts of perspectives. I mean, to his credit, um, he was the one who was really pushing, going back and looking at all these at that time rather obscure and things hadn't worked out for them new wave of british heavy metal acts like blitzkrieg or diamond head um budgie I, I guess you could say was doing well they covered one budgie song on that but budgie had also kind of kind of slipped into obscurity so mm -hmm. they they were it was doing kind of double duty it's well it's triple duty right it's they get to play a song that has been formative for them that they think is a good metal song, a good standard. Um, they get to redirect attention back to these uh, bands that haven't made it. And they also get to funnel some money to them. You know, like, like we're saying, Am I Evil um, made Diamond Head more money as a Metallica song than it ever made them as a Diamond Head song, right? So- um, Like they said, the paychecks went to them um because they owned so every time metallica sold an album or that or a download of that song or whatever they end up they end up getting uh diamond head ends up getting the money i suppose i mean i don't want to get too far into the weeds and finance stuff but you know if, if you're producing a cover thing you can write off your salary to produce it and the time in the studio and whatever you have to buy as business expenses, right? So the, the musicians are getting not the gross, but the net uh, from it. So, so you could pay yourself a good amount of money to like make cover songs. You could, you know, oh, cook, yeah, the, cook I, the books that way, right? Yeah, that's, a, that's a good point. So yeah, um, recording because, expenses you deduct at the end of the year. Yeah, you could be like, oh, you know, um, I, my time is worth $200 an hour. I'm going to be in the studio, you know, recording this for X amount of time. I pay myself that. And then if there's profit left over, then I pay the, the uh, other musicians. Because yeah. it's a business expense, right? It, it is a business expense. And, you know, you have to pay for the engineer. You have to pay for the pressings or the right, right. or the, and whatever that, you just keep the receipts for that. And um, that's an interesting point. I'm going to have to dig into that because a lot of this. I would be curious uh, to know more about that too. Yeah. The conversation is, is um, I don't want to put, you know, each of these bands might have their own reasons for doing a, a cover album. And, I don't want to blanket them in, in, into thinking, well, you know, I have more questions than answers on this topic. Um, yeah. I know myself. Um, well, I, you know, like, again, with the Raven one, that was a perk for a Kickstarter campaign. They um, gave it to people who gave a certain level. Uh, we happened to have given that level, and that's, that's how we wound up getting it, the Party Animals album. But they, you know, a business expense would be they have to pay the mm -hmm. bands they're covering to like put the album. They can't put the album out before they get the licensing. So they have right. to pay for the light. So it's going to cost them money, which I guess you're right. They can deduct, but it's, it costs you money to do a cover album. Like if I did a cover album, um, we, we go to Harry Fox, which is, you know, the, the, the person you go to and say, these are the songs I want to cover. And then they quote you and then you pay a lump sum mm -hmm. uh, for rights to use that song. But then once, once you've gone past that lump sum, you could, you could keep the revenue after that. Right. Uh, you don't know, you don't own the rights. You, 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 you got have to double have license. Okay. okay. You, have, you have the licensee to use it, but see when you sell albums, the, yeah. whoever has a publishing gets that money too, but you're, but you paid for the right to use it. So you don't get sued. Yeah. Mark has a question here. Would you say covering songs is an important part of musical pedagogy? Learning to play other band songs is how I learned to play guitar long before I ever began learning musical theory. And I'm going to say something really quick because Scott is definitely the person to answer this. As a amateur musician myself, playing cover songs is a temptation because I'd much rather 
putter around and play other people's songs on my banjo or guitar and or, or, or bass and, and sing them to myself than I would doing finger exercises or the other things that I ought to be doing to improve myself as a musician. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, um, no, that's, that's a really good point. Doing cover songs is different than like a, a, an established band recovering, uh, re, uh, recording them. So like early in my career, I played in, you know, it was the tail end of what we called show bands where you travel the country and you'd play covers. You get paid handsomely for it. But, um, and what that did to me is for me is I learned some of the best guitar parts of, off the old soul albums. I learned some of the best guitar parts done by session players. And I kind of learned how to, you know, decorate different kinds of songs, um, get my sound together. Mm. Um, get, you know, so these, this was an opportunity for me to do that. And a lot of people, you know, even great songwriters will say, I learned harmony and harmony is how you put chords together, right? And they learned uh, songwriting harmony from learning a ton of Beatles songs. Hmm. So, you know, a, a lot of us learn our songwriting craft from what we listen to. So you might not sound anything like the Beatles, like, you know, some of the people that say, I swear by the Beatles, but they said, oh, these chords can go together. And then you start, start exploring, maybe these chords will go together. Maybe so I learning covers is a big thing you know um and you know i still transcribe herbie hancock solos and stuff because i want to dig in now, i guess i'm covering his improvised solo or other people but i learned something about intervals that i didn't think about and uh so the technical aspect is good so covering is good i guess that's a whole different thing you know like you say like the band like van halen all these bands were in cover bands at one time i'm sure um, or most of them played covers before they joined a rock band and, and, and got big. That's the, that's the old model. I don't know about these days, what, what the young generation is doing as much. But... That's, that's an interesting point. You know, I, I brought up at the very beginning uh, that Berkeley school of music has a page about how to do your own covers and then put them in YouTube and they give you like five pieces of advice for it. And I think that there's, there's probably, um, a lot of young musicians who are planning to do covers, but they're planning to do covers not as a band, but as their own individual thing. So it'll be like them with a guitar, or it might be one of these things where you see people and they've got themselves, you know, in a couple different um, uh, windows and they're singing harmony with themselves and playing different instruments and things like that. Um, I, I don't know that there's, I mean, I think there's still cover cover banding out there right as as a oh, there is. yeah thing because uh, who else would, what else would be going on at weddings for example right That's a good but, point. yeah and just you know a, a side note um one of the casualties of all that's going on in the music business is arts theaters now are primarily booking tribute bands and I asked oh, a friend of mine and I said why are you this is an art center for musicians you know an original artist yeah. And they said, well, the only people bringing in money are tribute bands, the AC, ACDC tribute band. So, I mean, comedy tribute band. do you think that that's, do you think that's like significant of a, a, a shift where we're seeing less emphasis on like, I'm going to do my own original thing and it's going to be within this, this particular established genre and I'm going to be breaking out in that and more like, well, you know, the genre is established now. Um, I'll just work within it and do things that people can recognize, whether it be individual songs, right, a, a cover, or whether it be like a repertoire, uh, a tribute, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, as far as the, you know, reference on how to do a YouTube cover, um, I'm curious to see if major music schools are only using what I call the um, Silicon Valley model. And if, if anybody knows musicians or sees them on, you know, we're not being paid fairly. We're, you know, Spotify, well, Spotify doesn't have to pay you anything, yeah. but you also don't have to be there. And um, are, we are we teaching the Silicon Valley narrative or are people getting creative as they should? Now, the people on Instagram or whatever on YouTube doing covers, I mean, it's very rare that you make even 
part-time job money on there. That would be huge if you made, you might make a few bucks. You might have somebody send you a free guitar strap, but yeah. it's, it's certainly not a sustainable way to fame. Maybe 1% of the people that do it, which is a, which is, you know, probably not people, even that much, not even that. And so, but yeah. the, you know, people like to point to, well, so-and-so came up through there. Yeah. yeah well, good, well, so I can point to people that won the lottery. Well, that reminds me though of something that uh, a friend of mine who Scott knows as well, uh, Blitch66 said about uh, the LA scene. And I think I brought this up in, a, in another session. Um, he went from, be, from being a New York musician, a heavy metal musician established in New York, a bassist and all of that. And he moved out to LA in the nineties and he started looking around and LA was the place to be in the set, late seventies and the early eighties. And even into the late eighties, but by the nineties, this is, this is where Blitch was really smart. He was like, wow, there's a lot of people out here chasing that proverbial brass ring. hoping it's gold. And there's way more of them than there used to be. Not all of these people are are, even just a small fraction are not going to uh, get something. And instead he's, he was like, well, I'm probably not going to make it as a musician out here just as a musician, but what do musicians need? Well, you know, they need things like food and shelter. Well, they'll find that from somebody else. He started designing clothes for them because they all, whether they're making it or not, they all need a look. And so that was That's a really true. smart thing on his part, you know, but the, the main point of that is perhaps the like being discovered on YouTube thing. That's probably tapped out at this point, you know? And also what do you get discovered? You know, I have a lot of students that do extremely well on TikTok, but a lot of people do extremely well on TikTok. And, you know, I remember an interview of a Berkeley student and the first question they asked is what's it like to be famous? And I stopped there and said, is this person famous? I mean, even if I go to my music page and I take the, I don't have that many followers to my Facebook music page, it might be about 2000. Yeah. But, but if Greg, if you went to each of them and say, do you know Scott Teruli? I bet you half of them wouldn't. It's just something they clicked on. Right, not, right. They're, they're, these aren't paid customers. These are, you know, nor- returning customers. Yeah. That, well, that, that, well, no, they're not paid customers in the first place. They just clicked like that. I don't make any money for somebody liking my page, but yeah. if, they come, if it turns out that they pay attention and come to my shows, buy my merchandise, go to my website and do that stuff. Well, you know that, but that doesn't more often than not, it doesn't transition. The problem is we have a generation of people that would rather the attention than any money. They, they themselves have no monetary interest in music as musicians so if they're going to do covers they don't mind as long as they said they got that sixty thousand views yeah. well, what does that mean i mean in the long yeah run, in in a way i mean get rock and roll money is not something we can look at people's lives right we can say wow that didn't last long that advance that you got you know right. or whatever whatever it was that was getting paid out um we all know about lots of destitute rock and roll musicians who've lived past their means but attention in terms of um, social media and likes and people's eyeballs being on you is even even more ephemeral than money is right just because you were being watched a lot last month that doesn't guarantee you'll be watched at all next month and that happens a lot and and you know to be honest the views if you ever scroll through instagram if a video starts while you scroll past it Mm -hmm. It, that counts as a view, but I didn't. Oh, look at right, it. right, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, people pay for sponsors. It all comes down to if you want to get more notice, you pay these Silicon Valley people that we all yell at are billionaires. Why are these people billionaires? Because you're paying them money to give you attention. You yeah. know, don't blame them. You're, I mean, like if 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 you don't like them, don't use you know do the old model. Go out into town, go to everybody's show, meet up with people double bill with someone, switch in the next state with you, you know, build that and, you know, people that are actually going to go and pay for the shows. Um, and, you know, this whole thing about going back to cover songs is, mm-hmm. the, 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 I don't know, like if, you, Greg, you've probably heard this before. People used to say, well, you know, if you want to be an original band, be a cover band and sneak one of your songs in. Well, no, that's not your demographic. You're in a bar where drunk people want to hear... <laughs> You know, Street Fight Man by, you know, the Rolling Stones. They don't want to yeah, hear yeah. They'll, 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 you know, so it's, you know, it's about audience. 
I would think if you're a tribute band, as opposed to just a covers band, it must be even worse. You're never going to stick in one of your own songs because it doesn't fit the canon of the, you know, oh, or the yeah. catalog, right? And I have a lot of respect for these people that can um, do those things, but I, I don't have any interest in it because I'd have to put my time into, say, sounding and looking just like Jimmy Page. Mm -hmm. And that's an, that's an odd identity thing for me, but I, you know, more power to the people that are doing it because they're making a lot of money. They're doing something right. That would be like if I, as a philosophy professor, um, were to, so I'm teaching like say Aristotle, if I had to like look like Aristotle and sound like him coming in, you, you know? Well, if you did like, yeah, if all of your lectures, were you dressing like Aristotle and then like somebody bringing up stoic stuff, which you know about and you suddenly I have to put on a new garb and, you know, <laughs> act like, start limping around like Epictetus or. I mean, you know, um, it, it's an identity thing for me. And uh, I think everybody has to look why they're in it. And if it's for that attention, the problem is to an 18 or 19 year old is unless they have other plans mm. to, to do stuff, they might, they possibly might be living at home. They, uh, or they'll have a full-time job to pay the billionaires in Silicon Valley for that attention. You pay the people to, you know, and then you yeah. get eighth of his penny for, you know. For each play, yeah. Yeah, and, um, you know, it's just, people say that's how it is, catch up with the times, but it's not how it is. It's what you're subscribing to. There's, we're creative. There's plenty of things. I'm not on streaming. So you're saying there's different models available, but of course there are. One, one is being pushed as like the de facto model. And then the other is you kind of have to work at to find or, or to develop. Right. Yeah. I, um, it's true that, you know, um, but the Silicon Valley story is, Hey, you got a computer, you got a studio, you got an iPhone, you got a camera, you could, you've got everything you need. Everybody's an artist. Well, yeah. we all know that that's not true. You spend years developing your artistry. Doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're not good when you're young, but um, and you know, I I I'm not on. I make my life, my my living as a musician, but I'm not on streaming, um, any of the platforms. And I do play out live a lot for other players, and um, and it is very difficult. But you know, you're fighting with people that will. I blame other artists, you know, for, okay. uh, no, no, if, if, if everybody pulled their stuff off Spotify, it'd be like, it would be like Starbucks having no coffee. <laughs> you know, it's like if you and I made all the coffee for Starbucks and they didn't pay us for it and we stopped giving Starbucks coffee, well, they would just be a building. Yeah. That's, that's oh. kind of a funny image to, <laughs> to bring in. I mean, do you think that the, this is like a much bigger conversation and I do want to bring this one to, to a close with something about covers, but um, at the risk of not being able to do that, let me ask, I mean, th that would only work if you could get a large number of artists to pull out of Spotify and that would take like, you know, coordinated action and awareness. Do you see that ever happening in, in our current culture? Well, you know, what's interesting that I keep saying we are in a time where people want extreme social change okay. and there's a lot of, uh, you know, for different reasons, um, you know, we've seen a year during COVID where there's been a lot of uh, strong feelings about things to, you know, but musicians don't seem to be part of that. Hmm. Musicians, um, especially the younger ones, you know, I'm, I'm getting older and I'm, I'll, I'll be completely irrelevant one day. And, but the ones that are coming in or will never know a time they had to pay for an album, never have a time where, you know, they would go out and see shows. Like they don't go out and see their peers. They just, you know, they'll watch videos on YouTube and it's like, well, you're not consuming it. So it's not, it's important. a very different media experience. You could say, right. You know, it's, it's not, it's, it's not the art experience. It's kind of like, if you go, to a museum and see the texture of a painting, see the actual color mm -hmm. um, and be in the presence of it. And it's like, ah, you could just see, you know, some, some blurry photos I took and that's the idea. And it's kind of like, well, we, like you and I talk about the bass hitting us in yeah. the chest and around the crowd and having that energy of, you know, and that's, a, that, there's a lot of experience beyond just, you know, the sound coming out of your iPhone. Or, or your any telephone or through your airpods yeah your, yeah that, that's and that's damaging to your ears because it's most of them are mp3s lossless available but takes up too much state space so people just use mp3 which is uh, it, it's like taking the mona lisa and 
making a photocopy of it 30 times, <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> So, you know, the experience is disappearing. Which, which people in effect are doing with their phones. You know, I, I was at the, the Louvre a um, couple of years ago and I, I did get to see the Mona Lisa, which is very disappointing because it's so tiny, you know, um, and you got to stand in this long line to, to get up there. It's like, a, you know, a cattle, cattle car kind of thing. Um, and everybody was getting up there to take a picture of it. As some right. people like to turn around and like take a selfie with it. Um, but most people were like, I will remember the Mona Lisa this way. I didn't take a picture of it because I was like, well, hell, if I can't remember it, you know, um, I don't know that this, you know, JPEG of it's going to do me any good. <laughs> so, Plus you could go home and Google it. Exactly. Yeah. Somebody else has probably taken a better picture, right? But, so, you know, to be in the presence, if you're at the Louvre, to be in front of like, you know, they have a lot of the French impressionists in there. Yeah. The texture and just like to see the texture it's a whole different world and then people say well most people don't care about that well it's like saying most people drink cupcake wine which is disgusting but you know fine wine drinkers we should just get rid of fine wines well there's millions of people that love fine wines is it the majority no but it doesn't mean we should take as you know martin luther king jr called the soft-minded and make that the the uh the norm the paradigm yeah or that or like you know what judges what everybody should get yeah mark says the form of the cover versus the shadow of the cover um so two different kinds of of imitation and maybe this is something that we have to come back to the question of imitation <clears throat> oh because there's there's a lot more i think to to plumb here so this has been a pretty free-ranging conversation uh, interrupted at first by some bombing, right? <laughs> and then uh, Scott getting booted off for, for a brief period. Um, but, you know, we thank everybody for, for joining us and for the comments and questions and conversation and hope this has been interesting, at least. Uh, anything you want to add, Scott? No, I, I like where it went. I like the discussion. And this is the first one where I have, I still have more questions, but we had a lot of theories that could be possible. I like kicking mm. those back and forth. Like, um, what's, you know, what's the motivation in doing this? And then I love the Halford story. I hadn't heard that one. So thanks for reading that. You know, there's, there's actually a postscript to that, which I'll, I'll bring up uh, before we go. So he met Joan Baez. This is what he, he said. Did? Yeah. Um, backstage at Live Aid in Philadelphia, Halford saw Baez coming up to him and he, and he, his, his immediate thing was like, oh crap. <laughs> She is not going to be happy with, with me. And then here's what, what she said to him. Um, Rob, I just want to say thank you for what you did with Diamonds and Rust. And I said, well, that's really great, Joan. I really appreciate it. That's so cool. And then she said, yeah, because my son is a big Judas Priest fan and he liked your version better than my version. <laughs> so isn't that a great story? <laughs> you know, you got the intergenerationality in there and, you know, uh, the difference in, in genre and some real graciousness on the part of the musicians. So and that, that used to be not, you know, not too long ago, but that's used, used to be the seventies when you saw Joni Mitchell and Miles Davis talking and Jimi Hendrix and, you know, Miles Davis or whoever, they all just talked regardless of genre. Mm -hmm. And they're all kind of like, you know, making mutant part of the art. So that's a nice moment. Yeah. Live Aid made that possible. Yeah, uh, a crossing of genres. So on that note, we're, we're going to sign off. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining again. Thanks, I Scott, think. for for making the time and my pleasure. Uh, your, your insights. So we'll see all of you next time. Definitely.